What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, you're living on a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. If this video here on a Saturday gets to 1,000 likes, I will give one lucky commenter a cash prize. The winner will be announced on a live stream, hopefully next week. In honor of Thanksgiving, let's get back to one of our commenters. Let's get in, ladies and gentlemen, to another very interesting organized crime topic. And when we talk about the history of the Bonanno crime family, there's one name that can't not be discussed. Joe Messino. For over 30 years, Joey Messino basically led the Bonanno crime family. He took them through a lot of very difficult times and ultimately did something that no boss of the mafia has ever done before. He had certain people around him, one of which his brother-in-law, Salvatore Vitali. Now, Vitali at one point was a correctional officer in New York City. Question is, why did Joey Messino allow him to be connected to the mafia. Family sometimes is more important than anything else. Today, we're going to get into Vitali and more. The story of Salvatore Vitali next on Sit Down Short. Salvatore Vitali was born September 22nd, 1947, in Brooklyn, New York. As a kid, he and his family would move to the Queen's Enclave of Maspeth. Salvatore Vitali would have three sisters. He was the only boy in the household. Now, his parents were both Sicilian immigrants from the small rural town of San Giuseppe Giotto, just outside and south of the capital of Palermo. Now, for Salvatore Vitali, he, as I said, was the only boy in the household. And he would take quickly to one of his sister's new boyfriends. One of his sisters, Josephine Vitali, would ultimately meet in 1956 an individual called Joey. That would be Joe Messino. Now, Joe Messino was four years old, four years older than Salvatore Vitali. And Vitali would say at one point that without Joey Messino, he would never have become anywhere near what he had become. Truly, since they were kids, Vitali would credit Messino really. From teaching him everything, how to fight, how to swim, how to steal, how to kill. Vitali looked at Messino as the older brother that he never had. And for someone like Joey Messino, who, as we know, had one job he was ever going to do, Vitali really just delayed the inevitable in his life. Now, for Salvatore Vitali, though, he would take a very normal uh, career path, really, as far as normal people. Salvatore Vitali would eventually graduate from Grover Cleveland High School in Ridgewood, Queens. Now, upon his graduation from high school, Vitali would send, put, spend a period of time in City College. He then decided to join the military, where he would last several years. He would be discharged and in the late 60s returned to his area of Maspeth. Now, for Salvatore Vitali, he would take what normally a lot of New Yorkers do a civil service job. For a period of time, Salvatore Vitali would work in corrections for the city of New York out of a Queens office. Very interesting. Um, now, from what I understand and from what I know, Salvatore Vitali did not work directly in a prison. From what I understand, he worked, I believe, as some sort of driver or some sort of um, you know chauffeur for prison uh, inmates. I don't believe he worked directly with inmates in a prison, but he may have at one point uh, been in and around uh, prisons. Now, for Vitaly, that should preclude him from ever being connected to the mafia. But again, one thing we know is the mafia is willing to break rules when it comes to families occasionally. Okay, We do know of law enforcement, none of which to this level, though. Uh, we've obviously heard about people like the mafia cops being police officers that ended up working for the mob, but no one really that worked in the 
prison uh, departments or corrections departments uh, ever really associated with the mafia. Now, for Sal Vitale, he would quickly begun, begin being tired of being in corrections and would initially leave that job in the late 60s. He would go to the older brother he never had, Joey Messino, and basically say, uh, I want to work with you, just like any kid or brother of a mobster would do. Uh, now, at this time, Joey Messino is quickly becoming a uh, kind of rising star in the Bonanno crime play. We know of his connection to boss of the family, Philip Rusty Rustelli. But for Joey Messino, he began work, as we know. I did a sit-down episode of Joey Messino seen here. What we would find out is Joey Messino actually was very much in his early life involved with lunch truck wagons. Joey Messino had a very burgeoning business uh, where he would deliver uh, sandwiches and other uh, things to workers and factories and other uh, places. He would also take up flight in the unions as far as lunch truck workers. But one thing Messina was also doing is he was running numbers. He was running a bookmaking operation. He was giving out loans uh, from his lunch trucks. According to Salvatore Vitali, Joey Messina would put him in charge of his numbers business. Now, ultimately as well, Messina would open a catering company called King Caterers. Salvatore Vitali would be given a no-show job with that business. Now, for Vitali, he would become an associate and be placed under the leadership of basically Messino. Anything Messino made, they would split and kick up. So what Vitali was doing is becoming a very normal earner. He has a legitimate job. In fact, he has multiple legitimate jobs, and he's making a good a nut each week uh, doing loan sharking and uh, bookmaking and numbers. That's all very big business for the Bonanno crime family. As I said with Joey Messino, the good thing for Sal Vitale was Messino was becoming the rising star. And generally, when you want to do well as well, you either become that person as well or you latch on. That's exactly what Vitale did. He was his brother-in-law. It's that simple. By this point, Joey Messino had married Salvatore Vitale's sister, Josephine. They would be married in 1960. Now, ultimately, as we know in the mafia, you have to be called on eventually to participate in certain violent crimes. And for Sal Vitale, he would be called upon in 1975 to do that. By this point, he's making money, earning, but it's time to rise up for the family. For Salvatore Vitale and Joey Messino, they would be contacted allegedly by Paul Castellano. Now, Joey Messino would talk about this, this uh, sort of meeting and what would ultimately happen in testimony years later. During this time in 1975, Big Paul Castellano was having an issue, not with someone in the family, a low-level criminal that was dating his daughter. According to Castellano, uh, the individual Vito Borelli was talking disparaging about Castellano. He was making fun of him. He was sending wisecracks out about Castellano. And in Castellano's world, that wasn't going to happen. Castellano ordered that Vito Borelli be killed. I guess I ultimately didn't really care what his daughter thought about that. How would he explain that to her at Thanksgiving? I don't really know. But ultimately, he ordered members of the Bonanno crime family alongside up-and-comer John Gotti to take care of Borelli. Now, according to Joseph Messino, he would talk about this hit pretty openly in his testimony years later. He would basically say that that day he would be at the hit and the trigger man was none other than John Gotti himself. This is one of the only pieces of evidence we have that John Gotti ever actually killed someone on his own. We know he ordered many hits. He may have been at hits, but this is one of the hits that we know of that John Gotti likely committed on his own. Now, Salvatore Vitale would be involved with this murder as well, but not the actual murder. He would supply the van that would transport the body of Mr. Borelli to an unknown location. At the unknown lo location, uh, members of the Bonanno crime family, as well as Vitali, would not only dismember the body, but ultimately clean up uh, the body as well. So Vitali would be involved in his first actual murder. Now, Vitali would also be very involved with the planning uh, of an upheaval attempt that was beginning to happen in the Bonanno crime family. As we know, the three capos, Philip Lucky, Giancone, Dominic Trinchera, and Alphonse Sonny Red and Delicato, we're looking to make a play on the family. I'm not going to go into that hit again, but Vitali was very much involved with what went on that day in 1981, in the early 80s. 
I do want to get in, though, to a very important murder that would happen. And this would really propel Vitaly from being kind of just an associate to a soldier and then quickly the underboss of the Bonanno crime family. By the early 80s, once the three Kappas are taken out, Joey Messino basically is the boss of the Bonanno crime family. Philip Rostelli is in jail, um, and he had basically given up control. And for the most part, Messino was his guy on the streets anyway. So either way, he was very high up at that point. An individual that needed to eventually be taken care of was this individual, Caesar Bonaventure. Now, Bonaventure uh, was what we would call a Sicilian zip, uh, like many in the Bonanno crime family. He was from Casa Lamari del Golfo, and he alongside a fellow Zip, Baldo Amato. That's not Baldo Amato. That's Baldo Amato. Baldo Amato and Bonaventure were actually tasked as bodyguards initially for Carmen Galanti. And at the hit in 1979, miraculously were able to get away without being shot. We have to believe Bonaventure and Amato were likely in on the hit. By this point, Bonaventure is a captain. And from what I understand, around this time, Rostelli was actually on the street for a very brief period of time. And Bonaventure got involved with something he shouldn't have gotten involved in. I guess he extorted some sort of individual that was kicking up to Rostelli. Rostelli makes a beef about it. And ultimately, it's decided that uh, through Rostelli and Joey Messino that Bonaventure needs to go. I think a lot of people looked at Bonaventure possibly as someone that could rise in the family. He was a captain. People were a little worried. And Joey Messino says, you know what? F it. Let's just cut him off. Let's get rid of him. So Messino decides... He's going to give the hit uh, to his uh, brother-in-law, Salvatore Vitali and Louis Haha Atanasio. Now, Louis Haha is uh, a hitman, and by this point, uh, people believe he can take this guy out. Now, at one point, Vitali would ask Messino about Baldo Amato, and basically, what will we do if, when we try to get Bonaventure, Baldo Amato shows up? They were going to do it through the guise of Bonaventure needed to have a meeting with Rostelli. That'd be the time to kill him. But they were worried that Baldo would show up as well. Messino would respond to Vitali if Baldo shows up, quote, take him out too. Now, Messino would also warn Vitali about the dangers of Bonaventure, quote, he's sharp. You have to be careful. So what they cook up at the Nacio and uh, Vitali is they'll pick up Mr. Bonaventure on the guise of a meeting with Rostelli to allow him to get in the front seat, passenger side, which is a sign of, sign of respect. Louis Haha is in the back. As they're driving, you get close to the garage that they're going to dispose of the body. They pump a couple of bullets into Bonaventure. Now, Louis Haha made a very interesting point. He basically said, it ain't going to take more than one bullet. I'll get rid of him in one shot. They're driving. Atanasio pulls the trigger, but Bonaventure is not killed uh, uh, right away. He tries to wrestle the steering wheel away from Vitali. The car's careening. Uh, eventually, Louis Haha shoots him again. Boom, boom, boom. That's that. Now, Bonaventure uh, would obviously die there and was never seen again. Now, for Louis Haha, he would ultimately face justice for this, and we'll get through to that in just a second. Uh, but for this uh, murder, Salvatore Vitali was likely at that point. Uh, because he becomes a made member of the Bonanno crime family. According to the great and one of the most comprehensive websites in this business, LCM Blogspot, they would say that Salvatore Vitali would be made in early 1984. Vitali, alongside uh, on the left, James Tartaglione, would be involved in a ceremony preceded over by Stevie Beef Canone and Joey Messino. That night, those two individuals would become button men in the Bonanno crime family. They would get their button. Vitali would quickly rise up in the family. The good thing for Sal Vitali is, is by the mid-80s, Joey Messino is basically in control. And by 87, uh, he basically takes over the family on the street. Joey Messino would also instruct that at one point, uh, Mr. Vitali needs to take care of an individual called Gabriel Infante. Infante was a member of the Bonanno family in North Jersey at a Bloomfield. He was tasked with getting rid of um, the Bonaventure body. He doesn't uh, ultimately uh, do that correctly. And then the body is found, which wasn't good. It was dismembered, all sorts of stuff. And Infante is um, ordered to be killed. Vitali takes care of that as well. And by 87, 
hypothetically, not necessarily officially, but the boss of the family in 1987 uh, was Joey Messino. In 1991, that's when Joey Messino is officially made the boss of the Bonanno crime family. And guess who he tasks to be his underboss? His brother-in-law, Salvatore Handsome Sal Vitali. Things were good for Vitali, And on the street, he was also starting to do his thing as well. He continued to earn through all the different mob rackets. Joey Messino has catering companies and a social club and a restaurant. Everything's working good, finally, for the Bonanno crime family. They had had a deal with a lot of bad things. The Donnie Brasco scaff snafu, the uh, upheaval by the three capos. There was a lot of muddy waters Joey Messino took the family through. And this would uh, create a really 10-year big-time period for the Bonanno family, which we'll get into. One of the main people on the street and someone that Mr. Vitali would propose for membership was this individual, Joseph Joey Shakes to Stefano. It was said that he was under Mr. Vitali and was his number two and really handled a lot of important things for handsome Sal Vitali. Again, like I said, Joey Messino really took the family through some crazy times. And once he became boss, this family transformed itself. It became one of the more powerful families in New York. In fact, at one point, a member of the Genovese crime family, Alan Baldy Longo, could be heard on Wiretap discussing that the Genovese were the most powerful. The only other crew or group that could rival the Genovese was, quote, Joe's family. That would mean Joe Messino. Now, Joe Messino, alongside Vitali, did a lot of revolutionary things for the Bonanno family. They outlawed social clubs. They had rules on funerals. They had rules on kicking up. They had rules on membership. They had rules on everything. And it really allowed them to become a big force in New York. In fact, during the 90s and up until the late 90s, early 2000s, the Bonanno family had no informants. In fact, they were also um, not being prosecuted due to the fact that the organized crime task force were worried more about other families. They weren't necessarily worried about the, Don the Bonanno family. In 1999, though, Joey Messina would start to have to deal with certain things that were presenting themselves in front of him. By this point, he was one of the most powerful people in organized crime in America. Now, in 1999, by this point, Sal uh, Vitali was handling a lot of things, but during this time, up until 1999, Vitaly had been arrested multiple times, but nothing was sticking. He never went to prison. People were starting to wonder about Hanson and Sal Vitaly. Why was he not going to jail? Kind of interesting, right? In 1999, he is tasked directly with handling all the Kappas in the family. And he goes to Joey Messino and says, basically, hey, um, I think we have a problem here in the family. He would say that one of the capos based out of Staten Island, Anthony T.G. Graziano, uh, he believed was on drugs. Now, um, this is not the first time we have heard this, um, and this wasn't the last time Joe Messino would hear about it. Joe Messino would basically say that, you know, it wasn't drugs. He was just old and he was on medication and don't worry about it. Now, people continued to make well aware that T.G. was likely on drugs, including Vitaly. Also, at one point, Mike P. Scars, D. Leonardo, a Gambino crime family heavyweight, would say that he actually believed as well that at one point T.G. was visibly on drugs and just acted really weird. Um, also, someone that would present this problem was this person, Gerlando George from Canada, Shasha. Now, Shasha was a very powerful Canadian gangster. Uh, and was very close with the upper echelon of the Bonanno crime family. I think Joey Messino, though, used this as a manipulative time. He basically believed, I think in his head, that George from Canada was a threat. A lot of people liked him. A lot of people viewed him as boss material. So George from Canada starts making the beef as well. Hey, TG's a junkie. We need to get rid of him. Joey Messino says, you know what? I can kill two birds at one stone. I can stop this from happening, and I can get rid of a threat. Now, he had to be careful because George from Canada was a very powerful individual and was very close with people like Vito Rizzuto. So he had to be careful with this. So Joey Messino at a wedding basically says, all right, Sal Vital, you're going to take care of this hit. I want Patty from the Bronx, Filippo, to handle this. It was very well known in the family that the Bronx faction led by Patty from the Bronx, he and George from Canada didn't see eye to eye at times. So this was a great spot 
for Patty from the Bronx to take him out, make it look bad like a robbery. Nobody knows anything. In 1999, that would indeed happen. George from Canada, Shah Shah, was killed. And his body was found in New York. They were insulated, though, for the most part. But ultimately, we would find out that most people would figure out that it was the Bonanno crime family that offed George from Canada. South Vitaly, though, was starting to have a major issue. By this point, he had basically realized um, that people were starting to talk and people were starting to wonder why he wasn't ever going to prison, including his brother-in-law, Joey Messino. Joey Messino was a smart individual, and he knew that something was going on. He needed to get to the bottom of it, and he started putting out some feelers about Vitaly. He would allegedly decide at one point to knock Vitaly down from underboss. And this was a big time for Zal Vitaly. He started to realize that maybe blood wasn't thicker than water uh, and that Joey Messino uh, likely uh, was very unhappy with him. A feud would ensue, and this would start to sow some real deceit that would happen in the Bonanno crime family. By this point, the family was falling apart for Joey Messino. People were starting to cooperate. People were starting to tell, and that was a big issue. Ultimately, in 2003, in early 2003, Joey Messino and Salvatore Vitale were both arrested by the federal government. Little did Sal Vitale know he had been marked for death. According to a Kappa regime that would flip Richard Cantarelli, he would tell the federal government that it was very widely known that certain people in the family knew that Salvatore Vitale was needed to be killed. The problem was Vitale didn't know it. And the FBI would tell him at that point. I think it was basically clear that was when Vitaly decided to cooperate. Now, I will say this about Vitaly. Notice, never went to prison. It was a corrections officer. Have we ever wondered maybe Sal Vitaly was a rat the entire time? Now, I'm not guessing. I'm not saying he was. But it is a very interesting thought, isn't it? For Sal Vitaly, the writing was on the wall. He was likely going to be killed. So what he decided to do is flip. This would set up one of the most destructive mob informants the mob has ever seen. Now, I would also learn some pretty interesting information while both of these individuals are in jail in the early 2000s. They would house them at different facilities. Mr. Vitale was in New York, in Manhattan. Joey Messino was in a Brooklyn bullpen. Now, according to former Bonanno associate and friend of the show, Frank Fiordolino, he would tell me that at one point he heard from Joey Messino directly and from other members of the Bonanno family that from this point on, Mr. Vitale was said to be referred to as Fredo, a reference to the godfather. It was very well known in the streets that Mr. Vitale was a rat, and uh, Joey Messino was obviously very worried about this. Joe Messino knew that... Vitaly was going to basically put him under the jail. And what we would ultimately find out is Joe Messino was going to face the death penalty for the hit on George from Canada, Shasha. This was bad news for Joey Messino. And Joey Messino would ultimately learn a lot more bad news while he was behind the wall. According to a very interesting wiretap, okay, once we found out Joey Messino was secretly an informant and decided to flip, we would find out something very interesting about Joey Messino. He would tell Bonanno boss at the time, Vincent Basciano, that basically he had heard through Genovese captain at the time in the 90s, Barney Belomo, that at one point Belomo heard that not only Vital, but he was conspiring with none other than John Gotti to kill Joey Messino. I guess in the 90s, Vitali realized that Joey Messino was not happy with him. So he secretly, allegedly went to John Gotti in the early 90s to kill Joey Messino. Joey Messino would say that he was lucky that Gotti got arrested because if he had not gotten arrested, he probably, they probably would have tried to kill him. In the wiretap, Joey Messino could be heard on tape saying to Basciano, quote, well, I found out in here that him and John were plotting, he said of Vital. Basciano would respond with, quote, I believe that. So a lot of people were disenchantized by Vital, and who would have thought Vitaly had the stones to possibly try to kill 
his brother-in-law. It was a bunch of deceit going on. Now, ultimately, for Salvatore Vitali, we will not look back on him, at least in most mob circles, as far as history is concerned, as one of the most destructive rats in the history of the mob. But I will tell you this, there was no more destructive rat, quite frankly, as far as putting people in jail than Salvatore Vitali. It was involved with by the Fed that Sal Vitali was a part of up to 11 different murders, including the hit on Caesar Bonaventure, George from Canada, Shasha, and many others. Ultimately, for Sal Vitali, he would get Joey Messino convicted and sent to prison. As we know, facing the death penalty, Joey Messino would ultimately, as well, decide to cooperate. But we look at what damage Mr. Vitali actually did, and it is extensive. You look at in the testimony of Vitali, 51 members of the mafia went to prison from the Bonanno crime family, from the Gambino crime family, from the Colombo crime family. 51 individuals went to prison. And we break it down more. Out of the 51 people that went to prison because of Salvatore Vitali, 18 were given 20 years or more to life. They were given long sentences. This wasn't 12 months or 28 months. They were given 20, 30 life sentences. They were incredibly damaging. And you look at really who goes away. It is a who's who of members of the mafia. Listen to some of these people that Mr. Vitali helped put in prison. Tony Green Urso, acting boss, Michael Mancuso, Louis Haha, Joe Camerano Sr., Jackie DeRoss, Peter Calabrese, uh, Frank Lino, Robert Lino, Danny Mangelli, Louis Restivo, Baldo Amato, B Bruno Andelicato, Don Pizzonia, Anthony Aciello, Anthony Frasone, Vita Rizzuto, Johnny Joe Spirito. I mean, tons of people went to prison because of Mr. Vitali. He was an incredibly effective witness. And at one point, he would be referred to as a super rat. And he would testify in other trials as well. He would come out of hiding and testify at the 2012 trial of Colombo heavyweight Thomas Tommy Schatz Gioelli. Salvatore Vitali would be credited in 2010 with time served and be released. Today, he is 75 years old and living somewhere in America under an assumed name. I'm asked all the time about who I would like to see on YouTube or in content. There is one union I'd love to see, Joey Messino and Sal Vitale. That would be interesting. It'll never happen, but it's interesting. One of the main reasons I started this show, this channel, this podcast, was to think about these individuals today. You look at both of them. One is 75. One is approaching 80 and Joey Messino. From what I understand about Joey Messino, he is completely alone. His family has completely deserted him. From what I understand, he's in a nursing home in the South. I'm not going to say where. From what I understand, Mr. Vitali is likely alone as well, living in uh, somewhere in America. I think I know where, but I'm not going to say. You look at all they've done in their life. What was it all for? According to Vitali in his testimony, he was asked in his 30 years of being connected to the mob, how much money did he make? Vitali would respond, a couple of million. Is that worth 30 years of your life? Is that worth where you are now? Looking at the mirror every day and seeing what's staring back at you? These people completely ostracize everyone that's important to them. And you look at in the end, most of the people we discuss are either dead, in jail, or alone. To me, that's no way to live life. And to me, it's one of the fascinating things about people in this world. Um, Vitali, incredibly destructive to the mafia. Uh, he's not Gravano. He's not Leonetti, but he ain't far off. He was very destructive. It's that simple. As always, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. We're going to try to get this to 1,000. Make sure you subscribe if you're new here. As always, I do apologize for the longer video, but I always try to include as many details as I can as possible. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.